well, we have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank our youth who uh, planned a wonderful breakfast this morning. Ginger, thank you for leading that. Uh, it was a really good breakfast. And I think we're ready to go. Hopefully we raised a lot of money. All the residents there, I know they enjoyed that. Thank you for your efforts yesterday. Uh, I want to highlight a few of the announcements in the bulletin. We have a new members class starting this Friday, 6 to 8. Uh, the pastor says, I believe there are we think, four potential new members who will be joining us in that class. So we'd like to uh, certainly make them feel welcome and let's spread the word on that. Uh, Easter Lily order due by March the 17th. Order form was at the welcome table. Uh, Victoria Christian, I'm sorry, Victoria Methodist Church uh, had asked us to post this about a go tell Southside Virginia Crusade informational meeting March the 5th, 6 30 p.m. I'll leave that here on the rail. Any other announcements? Um, Sam and Gay Irby have a new grandson that was born this week, and all are doing well. So, so, any other announcements? I'm going to be a little early and say uh, for Easter, I know that we're at uh, the Harvest Grace School, we agreed to have a uh, sunrise service at our house again. Um, but we're going to also this year have uh, breakfast at church during Sunday school hour. And okay. so, the, at least the kids are, we encourage everyone to join us. I know we haven't had Sunday school. Uh, of Easter Sunday for the last couple of years. But we're going to just encourage people to read. Um, well, the high school kids are going to do charcuterie boards of different things, and so we encourage everyone to bring something this year. That's great. Excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a cousin who passed away this week, Gene Powers from Darwin. He died this week. Let's remember the power swim was the power. The funeral will be on Tuesday at 11. Thank you, Okay. Thank you. Let's also remember the family of Kenneth McDaniel who passed away this week. The funeral was yesterday. Any other announcements? Let's begin our worship service. Please join me in our opening prayer. Everlasting God, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Since the creation of the world, you have nurtured us with your love. When we consider the awesome works of your hands, your love for us is more than amazing. You have trusted us with the whole core of the earth and put everything we see under the care of our hands. Lord, our sovereign God, the earth is filled with your, your glory. This morning we come before you with humble faith, offering you the worship of our heart and life, and desiring your presence among us. Heavenly Father, help us and guide us in your goodness in this time of our worship together. We pray in the name of your greatest gift of love, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs>
The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I lack. God guides me in proper paths. For the sake of God's good name. God bathes my head in oil. My cup is so full, it spills over. Yes, God's goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Way, Jehovah. Let us sing together.
say the base wall has a change of direction. It's going fast in one direction and suddenly crack. It's sailing back in the opposite direction. The book of Acts, chapter 9, talks about a name, a man named Saul, who had a very sudden change in direction. He lived in a very old time in the kind of early church, and he was known to everyone as someone who hated Christian. He's the one who will track them down and then take them to the courts and throw them in jail and even try to kill them. Surely Saul was traveling in the wrong direction. So Saul was on his way to Damascus to arrest Jesus' followers when something happened that suddenly changed his direction. It was a sudden and loud like a crack of the bed against the wall. A brilliant light shone down from the heaven and knocking him off his horse. And he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He asked, who are you, sir? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go to the city and do what you're told, or, and do what it is told you must do. The man of the soul was so surprised and they were frightened because they heard a voice but didn't see anyone. So the soul was, because when Saul was able to stand up again, he was blind. He couldn't see anything. So his friend helped him to take him to the city. And there, a, a Christian man healed it, and Saul was able to see again. And guess what happened? Instantly, Saul tells everyone about Jesus, the Son of God. Isn't that interesting? So that if you are a really follower of Jesus, and if you have been shining Jesus' light, then keep it up to be in the right direction. But if you are, have done bad things and not following Jesus' teaching, here's how to change the direction. You ask God to forgive and help you to be a true follower of Jesus. Two weeks ago, we learned this memory verse from Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Do you remember this? What was it? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you want to do the with emotion? Do you remember? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us. Let's do it again. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Lord will be saved. All right, Romans 10, 13. Good job. I want you guys to continue to be highlighting that verse in your hearts, all right? Let's pray together. Dear God, when we're heading in one direction, stop us and turn us around. Please guide us in the right direction. Thank you for loving us first. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in prayer for the nation. Let's pray together. Living God, through the reading of the scriptures and by the power of the Spirit. May we hear our soul through the news and believe because of your word that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Amen. <coughs> this morning our scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. The whole Israelite community broke camp and set up from the sin desert to continue their journey as the Lord commanded. They set up their camp at Rapidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people argued with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why are you arguing with me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were very thirsty for water there, and they complained to Moses, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us of 
our children and our livestock with thirst. <coughs> so Moses cried out to the Lord, What should I do with these people? They are getting ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people, and take some of the Israel's enemies with you. Take in your hand the shepherd's rod, that you used to strike the Nile river, and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Hit the rock, water will come out of it, and the people will be able to drink. Moses did so while Israel's elders watched. He called the place Messiah and Meribah, because the Israelites argued with and tested the Lord, asking, Is the Lord really with us or not? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy God, we are so grateful for your love and grace this day. The love is amazing, never failing, and your, your grace is always sufficient that we are in need. God, as you listen to your word at this moment, allows your spirit so we open our ears to, to, still, to hear your still small voice, and we turn our face and seek out your plan towards us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all, all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, Lord. I will be my great teacher of peace and joy. Amen. So throughout the Old, Old Testament stories in the Bible, we can easily notice that there is a repeating pattern in the relationship between God and his people. It goes like this, Israel complains to God, or God's servant, about their hardships. Then God's judgment follows, for God, God for forgiveness and God providing grace offer to what they need. And they come back to God. This is kind of a repeating pattern in the stories between God and Israelites. This pattern does explain how God and his people related to each, to each, to each other and how God guided and protected and changed and delivered them during the course of their moving journey in the wilderness and also as they settled in the land of promise. And regarding this pattern of Exodus story, which is God's saving history of the Israelites, is the most prominent Example, revealing God's guide, guiding grace and satisfying love toward them. For example, in, in, in Exodus chapter 15, after traveling for three days from their Egyptian slavery, the Israelites find no water. Then they come to a place called Mara, which literally means bitter, so they are unable to drink water because the water there is bitter. So they complained to God through Moses and said, What will we drink? Then Moses responds by crying out to the Lord, who shows Moses a piece of wood. The bitter water is come sweet after he threw the wood into the water. Here in this passage, the Israelites complain to God about the bitter water, and God hears them and solves the problem. Then in verse 27, God continues to lead them to Elim and provides enough water for them to drink with 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees in the place for them to rest. And regarding this panel, we need to remember another important thing is there God's covenant with the people. For example, after Moses turned the bitter water into sweet, God makes a ruling to test their hearts and lives as an initial type of covenant. In verse 26, God says, If you are careful to obey the Lord your God, do what God thinks is right, pay attention to his commandments, and keep all of his regulations, then I won't bring on you any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians. I am the Lord who healed you. And I think this type of covenant between God and His people is one of the most important elements with all Christian faith journeyers. Because this covenant 
is the foundation of our faith journey. From its beginning to the finishing point of our life journey. And in the book of Exodus, again, this covenant piece is highlighted the most when it comes to chapter 19, which is the moment of receiving the Ten Commandments. This is the covenant God established with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai as God led them out of Egyptian slavery. And in Exodus chapter 19, we read this. On exactly, the, on exactly the third month anniversary of the Israelites leaving the Egyptian slavery, they arrived in the Sinai desert. Then God called Moses and said to him, So now, if you faithfully obey me and stay true to my covenant, you will be my most precious possession out of all the peoples, since the whole earth belongs to me. You will be a kingdom of priests for me and a holy nation. These are the words you should say to the Israelites. So Moses came down, called together the people's elders, and said before them all these words that the Lord has commanded him. The people all responded with one voice, everything that the Lord has said, we will do. The Moses reported to the Lord what the people said. Then in chapters 20 through 23, the, the, the Ten Commandments was, are given to the people and, and other case laws of how to worship God and, and how to deal with other nations are presented to the people of Israel. So based on this covenant, God supplied everything the people needed. God provided them food and protection throughout the wilderness journey for 40 years. And later, the law that God gave them was meant to govern and shape the people of Israel as a nation in the promised land. Then, in other words, we have God guided, God provided. Now, according to today's scripture reading in chapter 17, we meet another story about the lack of war. It's different from the chapter 15 of the story, but it's a similar story. But leaving the desert of sin, the Israelites went from place to place as God guided and directed them and ended up at Rephidim. However, there was no water for them there. It is important to, want, important to note that it was God who guided Israel to there. Then we might wonder, did God make the same mistake again? Back to Israelites. We are called as children of God amongst the ups and downs of this world. And faced with numerous trials in life, we try to live according to God's word, we try to read the Bible, and moreover, we try to live by applying the words of God to our lives. However, despite our efforts and tries, we often encounter numerous challenges we were not able to foresee. The, Israel's, the Israelites' response to the lack of water was again here to grumble, complaining to God. In the eyes of the Israelites, their dilemma was that being obedient to the Lord's commandment had led them astray to no drinking water. But there is more to the story in it here. Usually the meanings behind names of people or places in the Bible carry a special significance. In verse 7, and he called the place Massah, meaning trial or temptation, and Meribah, meaning quarrel or argument. So when we look closely at the quarrel between the Israelites and Moses in verse 2, they faulted Moses for bringing them into the wilderness. But the scripture makes it clear that it was God's will to challenge and pass them. But the Israelites were only fixated on the lack of water and placed all the blame on Moses, actually on God. In other words, they were blinded to the guidance of God. They were blinded to their own disobedience and lack of faith. 
The situation has pervaded to the point where, where, where Moses cried out to God that the Israelites were ready to stone him. Then did the Israelites act this way because they are foolish and childish or momentarily out of sorts? This is simply not the case. They were witness to God's ten tribes in Egypt already as they were about to leave there. And they were witness to the parting of the Red Sea and witness to God's guidance by means of pillar of clouds and pillar of fire. They also saw with their own eyes how God has miraculously sweetened the water and blood, and how he had provided prayer and manna to feed them. They had experienced first hand God's guiding grace at each and every trial they faced, but they hardened their hearts and did not believe God's promise. In response to Israel's complaining, God stages a miracle in verses 5 and 6. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of Israel's elders with you. Take in, take in your hand the shepherd's rod that you used to strike the Nile River and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Hit the rock, water will come out of it, and the people will be able to drink. Moses did so while the Israel's elders watched. It is easy to look down on the Israelites as foolish and childish or weak, but this could just as easily be us. When we look back at our own lives, we can see evidence of God's grace during hard times, but we we'll still doubt God's presence when things are not going well or when our desire is not satisfied. Today's Bible story tells us clearly where God guides, God provides. Where God guides, God provides. On July 1st, 1899, Thomas A. Dorsey was born in a small town, Georgia. He grew up, grew up around the church most of his early life. His dad was a big old Baptist preacher, and his mother started young Thomas on the piano when he was seven years old. And at the age of 21, he joined the Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago, where he led choirs and wrote more than 300 songs. In a taped interview in 1977, Thomas A. Dorsey told the following story. Let's hear it. My wife, Maddie, was about to bear our first child. I was called to St. Louis to sing in a little revival. I wondered if I should go because of my wife's condition. She persuaded me that I should go ahead, so I alone drove to St. Louis. During the first night of the meetings, a lot brought a telegram to me while I was still on the stage. It was horrible news. It was a message that my wife had died giving birth to my heart song. I rushed to a phone while the people were still singing and found that the message was true. That Mr. Gus Evans drove me back to Chicago that night. When I arrived, I found that the wonderful ba baby boy was seemingly fine, and yet, the night he also died. I buried my wife and little son in the same casket. I became very despondent and filled with grief. A few days later, I visited with my good friend, Professor Fry. We walked around the college campus for a while and then went into one of the music rooms. I sat down at a piano and began to improvise on the keyboard. And suddenly I found myself playing a particular melody that I hadn't played before that time. As I played, I began to say, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. A friend walked over to me and said, Why don't you make that Precious Lord. I then began to sing, Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, have me stand. When I finished the song, we began to use it, and it has been going ever since. I have gotten letters from people all over the world. It was a great tragedy, but we got the message, the word. 
This is the story behind the hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Isaiah 41, verse 13 says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say, say, say to you, do not fear, I will help you. Dear beloved Cambridge community of faith and Christ, as we continue on joining this season of Lent, we just don't live our lives as we're given. We intentionally participate in the passion and love of our Lord. We intentionally seek a renewal of our relationship with the Lord and reach out our hands to our Heavenly Father, asking His guiding grace during our life journey. Because our God is the one who leads us and provides what we need until we enter the kingdom of God. Where God guides, God provides. Sometimes we want to stop our journey because of hunger and thirsty. Or we feel running away from the path of God's grace because of fear and disappointment, just like the people of Israel. But this morning, our God, our Lord, calls us again to come back and follow the way of cross, the way of salvation in our lives. And our God, our provider, promised us that he will continue on helping us not only to get through this journey until we arrive at the cause, but also to witness and be blessed by the goodness of his providing grace. Dear friends, God promised to never leave us. God promised to give us rest and hope. To those of us who repent and believe in his Son, Jesus Christ, God promised that we shall not perish, but have eternal life. May God's peace and grace, goodness and mercy be with you and your families, and all of your relationships, and with the lives you have held. Amen. Our centering song, we'll be singing the Precious Lord, take my hand. This is the King number is 474. If you're able, please stand. <laughs>
let us offer our gift, the fruit of our labors, and the dedication of our heart for loving service in the name of Christ.
ist in der höchsten Quelle geworden, der in Hall, John und Schiff. In Spreesport, Frankenheim, Tatmärzen, Brenda-Ethel, Case Buckley, Janice Gehm, Ryan Pierce, der Wagenheim, Miracle Maker and Ultimate Healer, radiate your holy love to him. And lay down your healing hands on them, so they can find the truth that you are their creator, and you have promised them to be their provider when they are in need. Heavenly Father, I pray that you keep all our church families and protect our community with your strong heart. As we begin another new month, and you bind us with your faithful love, so we can continue to speak and encounter your loving heart with joy and thanksgiving. Our friends, let us center ourselves and take a step toward our gracious and loving God and seeking for his comforting peace. And loving grace in silence. God, we ask all this in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Now let us continue to pray as our Lord Jesus taught us while he was here on earth by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, for thy word. Amen. <coughs> Friends, now we move to the table of Holy Communion. At this table, our Lord gives us his very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins, and also he strengthened our faith at the table. So let us open our hearts and minds as we encounter the presence of the Lord. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known, and from you no secrets are today. Please the thoughts of our heart by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we may publicly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Dear friends, Christ our Lord invites to stay who all who love him, who honestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be the Christian church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear the good news, friends. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, that proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The grace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
Friends, the hour is coming and is now here. Go forth to worship and serve the Lord your God in all that you say and in all that you do. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ springing up like living water, fill your heart and flow through your life. Amen. Amen. 